There is a garden, there is a city, and there's a kingdom of God. And it is beautiful, and he is bringing it right now into our midst. Three weeks after my 22nd birthday, I got in a car with a drunk driver after partying all night, and I ended up getting seriously injured in a car accident. After that, I saw the power of prayer and God's compassion working directly in my life. God healed me and he gave me the strength to walk again. He gave me a new set of eyes and he gave me a second chance at life. And for this, I am forever grateful. From that day forward, I grew closer and closer in my relationship with Jesus. I know in my heart that I feel the Holy Spirit alive and well within me. And I am committed to fulfilling God's purpose for my life. I became very cynical and began to have a negative outlook on life, which didn't help in my relationships. I didn't know how to deal with this in a healthy way. I joined Men's Frat, which completely changed my life. Being in the presence of Christian men, I wanted to change. I needed to change. Since I began to follow Jesus, I have experienced a sense of contentment. I am more empathetic and do my best to understand and love everybody. I am proud of the person that I'm becoming since following Jesus. I used to be angry, hateful, demanding, depressed, tired, self-harmful, but my life has changed, and I will continue to get better with Jesus being at the center of my life. My soul is healed again. When I'm scared, when I pray, I feel glad and safe. I want to tell other people about God and how to get to know Him. God wants us to share the good news and show others that He loves them. That is exactly what I'm going to do. Two years ago, on this same day, the world was turned upside down by the pandemic. That was my last day of high school. And since then, I've been trying to find my way through college, relationships, and a ton of other new experiences, all while the world was navigating through COVID. Two years later, God is using this date to change my life again. This date will always be significant to me because it reminds me of God's faithfulness. I know that even when life changes, God does not. He led me through so much uncertainty, and I know he will always be with me to lead me forward in his plan for my life. True freedom and joy is found in Christ, and I hope my life can be a reflection of that. Man, there's, there's something about baptisms that is amazing. I, actually, our staff kind of fight and argue or who gets the privilege of getting in the, in the Baptist to do baptisms. And I think that just the idea of joy was everywhere that day. And it's just great. Yeah, great to first see. time I saw the video this morning, it was yeah. awesome. And as, uh, as Garrett mentioned, uh, just a couple of nights ago, we had Glow Night, an amazing event. Brian, I know you were working the coffee bar pretty hard. Yep. <laughs> How many of you got a coffee last Friday? Come on, there you go, nice. Awesome. Okay, now yep. notice I did not raise my hand. Nope. I, I stopped down there a couple times, and he just said, the line's pretty long, you gotta wait. So anyway, uh, there's uh, so many guests that were here. I mean, I just, man, walking around trying to say hi to as many people as I could. And, and one little girl, she was a guest, uh, a family brought her, and uh, she was seven or eight, and she was just, I said, did you have a good time? She says, oh, yes, can, can we do this again in two weeks? <laughs> 
Uh, so Brian said yes, <laughs> and, uh, and all of our youth staff are in the hospital now, oh, just man. recovering. Anyway, kidding, kidding. Be beautiful time. And I know you had a really good trip over in uh, Kurdistan. Yeah, I got back uh, Monday night. I was in the Kurdish region of Iraq. And uh, for those of you who don't know, many of you do know, we're, we are restarting our mission trips in yeah. a couple months. Yeah. Yay. Amen. Yay, God. So um, 16 or 17 of us will go to the Kurdish region of Iraq, which is northeast Iraq. And we have a partner there called End-to-End, -End, Neighbors to Nations, and it's led by Jeff Phillips. Many of you know Jeff. He's a missionary that we support. And we're gonna have a medical team of 11 people, and um, Ed Nelson's uh, leading that, and a bunch of people who have gone on trips to Ethiopia and Guatemala and elsewhere is com are coming along. And there also, we also have a, a construction crew as well that Tom Barrage is leading. So that's uh, middle of um, May to the end of May, so please be praying for that, and we're really, really excited yeah. about it. Yeah, and we're looking down the road to getting things relaunched in Guatemala. Ethiopia is a little more complicated just because of some of the, the political dynamics that are going over there. But really good to know that we're going to start to get our people back uh, back overseas. And uh, in just a minute, Brian, are going to like kind of wrap up week number eight of Unfinished. But next week, we are starting a really short series. We only have three Sundays, and then uh, Easter is one of them and Good Friday. And it's called Flip the Script. We're going to be looking at a couple of the messages that the world is giving and how the gospel just completely flips them around. Uh, Becky and I are actually going to kind of launch that by talking about this whole thing of change and what the world is saying about change and what God has to say about how change takes place. So really looking forward, uh, forward to that. And uh, so again, thanks for being here both on site, great uh, group today, and thank you for being online with us as we're moving into week number eight. And we are now going to finish up with Acts chapter 28, and let me just read a couple of verses from Acts chapter 28. Uh, I'm going to read from verse 23, we're talking about Paul. Now, he, Paul's in house arrest. It's actually a relatively okay situation for him there. But uh, pe all kinds of people are coming, he says large numbers. And he witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about, here's the key phrase, the kingdom of God. And from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. And then we go right to the very end of the chapter and we read this. For two whole years, Paul stayed there, stayed there in Rome, in his own rented house, and welcomed all who came to him to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now then, you know, then Acts comes to an end, and that ends about, you know, the year 62 or 63 AD. I know people are always wondering, well, what happened after that? What happened to Paul? And there's a couple of different ways you could think about it, but I think for the most part, Brian, uh, we're, we're on the, we, we kind of sense Paul lived a few more years, did some more missionary travel, maybe got as far west as Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a few more letters, the pastoral letters to uh, Timothy and Titus. And then he's back in Rome and a lot of bad things are starting to happen. And right around probably year 67 or so AD, he is uh, killed and, and Peter as well. Right. And so that happens. And the, the reason we, that most scholars think that that was the case is in AD 66, there is what's called the Jewish-Roman Wars. And um, those start, and then at, and, and there's tremendous persecution, including people being killed, people like Paul and Peter being killed. But in AD 70, this is an extremely important date, the temple is destroyed. Now, if you are a Jewish person, for hundreds and hundreds of years, the temple was the center of sort of how you worshiped God and it would now be destroyed forever, it was, it was gone. And so all Jews and as well as, as Gentiles, Christians were dispersed all over the Roman Empire and Jerusalem was not so important anymore. And so there is this movement, I mean this, this pushing out of people from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth as God's plan was, but one of the, the ways that happened was that, that the temples destroyed and it's, it, it's just monumental for, for the Middle East. Yeah, and not just for the Jews, but for the Christians as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so as we've been going through the last eight weeks, we have said that there are like six major themes in the book of Acts. You know, the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Word of God. That's the first group of three. And then the second group of three is church, world, and mission. So those six themes are in literally every chapter. But I, we'd like you to think about those six themes as all falling under this even maybe larger theme called the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is just like this dominant idea through the entire New Testament. 
And you just mentioned at the very end of the book of Acts where it says Paul preached the kingdom of God. Okay, so let me read another verse. Acts chapter one, verse three. So Brian just read the last few verses. I'm gonna read the third verse of the book. Listen to what it says. Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Same exact phrase. Very beginning of the book, kingdom of God. Very end of the book, kingdom of God. And, and it was not the first time Jesus started talking about the kingdom of God. Right, it was his dominant motif. It's the, the thing he talked about more than anything else for three years of his ministry. Okay, so the kingdom of God, like, since Jesus talked about it, since Paul's uh, talking about it for two years, uh, what is it? Well, probably a really good way to understand the kingdom of God. It is, it is the power and presence of God being with his people and maybe also a place, okay? Because his people tend to dwell in a place. So uh, the, the power and presence of God upon a people in a place where at that place and in that people, the will of God is being done, on earth as it is in heaven. And there are signs that that's taking place. Right, so the, the, the people of this kingdom, first of all, uh, and I'll come back to this, they have a king, and that king is Jesus. We'll, we'll come back to that in a couple minutes. But okay, how do these people, how do these kingdom people live? Well, um, they, they show a rich hospitality to people who they know and who they don't know. By the way, I, I think we did that a bit on Friday, that there were people who came and. We just, we were glad they were here and we wanted to be community with them. We wanted to be hospitable. So there's, there's this rich, deep, genuine hospitality. The, uh, the people of the kingdom, the, we love mercy. We love the mercy of God being poured out on people, right? We, we wanna be a gracious people. We wanna be people who have open hands and welcome and give and that's a sign of the kingdom. So, you, Jesus talks so many times in, in the Gospels about the kingdom being like this, and it, it often has to do with things like generosity and not holding on to things, but releasing things and giving and serving. That's, those are signs of a kingdom people. Yeah, and there's a, that, that great Old Testament verse, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, where we do justice, we love mercy, and we walk humbly with our God. I mean, there's more to it, but that's part of what you were talking about there. Mm -hmm. All right, so not only have we been like teaching the book of Acts, but Brian and I and others on our staff, we've been actually studying, uh, studying this book. We've been asking God to speak to us through this book. And for those of you who are in life groups, your final assignment as a life group for this series is we're gonna just give you some space for you to say, hey, how's God been speaking to me? What are those like big ideas that have grabbed hold of my heart? And what Brian and I want to do is today share a couple of the big ideas that have grabbed our hearts as we've gone through this material again. Yeah, so... Um Here's one for me. Um, th this has always been the case as I've read through Acts, but this time it hit me differently. The centrality of Jesus, but in a very specific way. The centrality of Jesus and his crucifixion and his resurrection. So in a few weeks, we are gonna be celebrating Good Friday and Easter, so this is like the biggest holiday in the Christian calendar. But for me, it hit me that in chapter after chapter after chapter, it, just, it wasn't just about Jesus the teacher or Jesus the sage or, or how his lifestyle even. It was that he was, he was described as having been crucified and raised to life. Now, think about it for a minute. If you read Acts chapter six where Stephen is killed, he's the first martyr, he's killed because he didn't just preach Jesus, he preached Jesus crucified and raised to life again for the forgiveness of sins. Or Acts chapter nine, Saul has this massive conversion and he does because he encounters who? The risen Christ, the crucified one who's been raised to life. Or Acts chapter 19, there's a riot in Ephesus and the riot is over uh, this goddess Artemis and, and sh this goddess is being challenged. Who is she challenged by? the risen Jesus Christ. Not, not just Jesus the teacher, not just, so th this struck me in such a powerful way this time that this idea that Jesus is not just a rabbi uh, in, in Acts, he's actually the promised Messiah of Israel who is not only just the anointed one, but he's, he's crucified on a cross for us and he's raised to life 
for not only our forgiveness of sin, but so that we can live as the people of God. Yeah. And this was really powerful for me this time. Yeah, and, and a few weeks ago we talked about in the world at the time there were just these small gods. That's right. And then this message of a crucified Savior and a resurrected God who is now Lord, it just burst like wildfire uh, in that part of the world. And there were many kings and many kingdoms. So, you know, this crucified Christ and resurrected Christ, he's the king, capital K, of the kingdom, capital K, and uh, of all the kingdoms, which is which is a radical thing at that time. I mean, and, massively. And eventually they were going to pay the price for that's right. that. That's right. All right, so here's, uh, here's the thing that maybe this one grabbed hold of me the most. And again, it's not like these things are new, but every now and then, you know, some stuff that you know just grabs hold of you really, really hard. And so, so this is the, the message that the church is this group of amazing people who previously have been deeply divided from one another because of the differences in their lives. And now, because of this Jesus, who Brian just mentioned, this crucified Savior, this resurrected God, because of this Jesus, they are now reconciled and connected with God again. And because of that, they are now connected with one another when before they were not. Um, as I was going through Acts this time, I did something a little different. So I've had a chronological Bible, but I got another one which I actually like better. And if you don't know what a chronological Bible is, is you know, the, the typical Bible is not arranged necessarily chronologically. It's arranged by types of literature. So you have the first five books of the Bible, and then you have uh, some of the historical books, then you have the wisdom literature, then you have the prophets. And so, but they're not necessarily arranged as they were happening chronologically. So if you get a chronological Bible, what, the, what they try to do is they say, well, how does this all fit together? And so going through the book of Acts, what they wind up doing is, as you're going through each chapter, they say, now where did the different letters of James, Peter, and Paul, where did those letters fit into what's happening? And so I'd be reading a chapter in the book of Acts, and the next thing you know, I'm reading Paul's letter to the Galatians, and it's like very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So I think what happened this time is, as I'm reading through the book of Acts, I had an even deeper appreciation of how important the church was for not only Paul, but for Peter and for, uh, for James. And... The Corinthian church was probably as divided and messy a church as there was. Yep. And to that group of people in 2 Corinthians, Paul winds up saying this. And here's where you see Paul's heart for the church. Beside everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. So pressure, is that word means like there's a weight, there's a preoccupation, there's a burden. So you know, Paul like daily had those pressures for the church weighing upon him. And then he uses the word concern. Now that word is a pretty fascinating word. Uh, it can be translated concern, it can be translated worry, and it can be, and at times it's translated in the New Testament as anxiety. And some of the newer translations are actually saying it's probably a better way to translate it. Uh, I know my anxieties for the church. But we don't want to believe that because Paul's the guy who wrote, be anxious for nothing. Right. So how can, he, how can he tell us, be anxious for nothing, when he say, man, I've got worries and maybe even anxieties. But Brian, I think it comes to this. Paul had no anxieties about himself. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had no anxieties at all. He could be in any situation, he knew God was going to take care of him. But when he looked around at what was going on in the church, and Paul's ideal for the church, he has some real genuine concern that things weren't going to work out very easily. And in fact, things were so messy in the church of Corinth that the very first chapter of the first letter, he winds up saying this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you should agree with one another, that there should be no divisions among you, and that you're perfectly united in mind and thought. And, and, and Brian, like in every single letter, Paul is talking about the unity of the church because it's, it's an ideal, it's beautiful, but it's really, really hard. Right. So, in the first century, all these diverse different people were thrown together in these cities. But they worked together, and they didn't get along. There were deep divisions. So it's called actually dividing walls of hostility. And what Paul believed in was the church was going to be this new community where all those things that previously kept people apart would no longer do that because now they had something greater than all those differences in common. What they had in common was this Jesus Christ, Savior, and resurrected Lord. What they now had in Jesus was greater and stronger than all the other things that would keep them apart. And Paul was passionate about that kind of new community uh, being formed. And he devoted his life to it, and it caused him great, great concern when it wasn't happening. And 
you know, over the last couple of years, I think the church in North America has sort of experienced more divisions and differences and frustrations. And, and, and I think if Paul was writing a letter today to the church, you know, he would have some deep, deep concerns about the, about the unity of the church. And, and Brian, it comes down to this. I like all the time we're talking to individuals, like you're to be a, this missional worker with God. And we are, we're all to be missional friends of Jesus out there. But Paul also has something bigger in mind. He's looking at the church itself, all of us together, as this mission of God in the world, as this place where the, this beautiful kingdom of God is growing and flourishing and we are loving one another and reconciled to one another and we're learning how to deal with differences and differences no longer divide. And as we're doing something like that, we wind up being the very kingdom of God on display to the world. And, and if that's not happening, Paul's got grave concerns about the mission of God uh, advancing. And, and Paul isn't, just so we're clear, he's, he's not saying that we are uh, uniform, right. but, but we're united. So he, he's not saying that we get rid of the differences. As a matter of fact, you, as you preached a few weeks ago about the Jerusalem Council, it was about Jews and Gentiles figuring out how to be community together and there being a greater cause, that is Christ, than what food they ate and, and how they... So there's this sense in which the, the church is to reflect the diversity of the world in socioeconomic, uh, skin color, ethnicity, all of those things. And, be, and not that those differences don't matter, but there is something greater than those differences. And you know, when I, when I first met Brian, he was, he's been, uh, he worked in Europe for 20 plus years and you were both a missionary in Europe, but then also uh, you were connected with and then eventually the lead pastor of a very, very multinational church. And I loved going there because it just felt like, wow, this feels a little bit more like, like the kingdom of God on earth. All these, all these nationalities from, from the countries of Europe, but also from many countries in Africa, many countries in Asia. And I think that's one of the reasons why I have loved world missions myself. I've done travel and worked in a lot of countries. I so enjoyed going and meeting people that were really different from me and it just always felt, oh, this is a lot more what the kingdom of God is like. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you have been overseas on missions trips. And one of the things we hear whenever you come back, I love meeting people that were so different. We just have this like intuitive sense of living word that the kingdom of God is really big and we want the kingdom of God to be really big right here. And what allows us to have those differences is that we are united in, in one thing and that is in Christ. And, and so we can have political differences or social differences or whatever, but if, if that, as you say, if we keep that main thing the main thing, then we can, we can wrestle through the differences. Okay, how about another big idea? Okay, so, um, we, so we talked about uh, Jesus, we talked about unity. So here's the third thing that hit me in reading Acts. Every single chapter, I, I like underlined, I went through multiple times in a chapter. There was this sense in which the centrality of God's purposes in the world comes through. The, 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 the focus that God has on seeking and saving the lost and on being gracious to his creation. Like it comes through in everything. So like you were talking about a little bit ago about this chronology. So in the middle of the book of Acts, um, Paul writes this letter to Rome, to the Christians in Rome, the, like the center of power, right? And in Romans, Romans chapter one, listen to these words for a moment. This is Romans 1, 14 to 16. Talking about God's purpose and mission is what Paul's talking about. He says, Paul says, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to those of you in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So listen to those words again. Paul is obligated, he's eager, and he's not ashamed. Obligated, eager, not ashamed. So we, we need to ask ourselves a question today. And online, all of you, you can ask it. All of us can just do a little reflection for a moment. To what are you and I obligated or responsible today? What, what, what deep down, what are we obligated to? We have many, many obligations in the world. But what's the highest obligation that we have? Okay, here's a second. What are you eager for? What, 
what, what drives you? What's the desire of your heart? What's your passion? What's, Paul, Paul says what he's eager for here. And then lastly, um, what are you not ashamed of? Or let's put it this way. What are you proud of? And I mean proud in the best sense of the word. Paul, Paul says what he's proud of, what he wants to sort of shout from the rooftops is Jesus wants to be gracious to you. Jesus wants you to know forgiveness. Jesus wants you in relationship with God. That's what he's obligated for. That, that's the mission of God that drives Paul. And we just see it all throughout the book of Acts. I mean, every single chapter, whether it's Paul or Barnabas, I mean, there's various people, or Stephen, who gets killed for it. Um, we see this over and over again, this mission of God to seek and save lost people and for his kingdom to come in our hearts. Yeah, and, and I've known you for so long, and I, mean, I, I think you take these ver words very personally for your own sense of calling. I, I think that's what we're, we're to be about. And, and, and it's, for all of us, we know this, it's a long obedience in the same direction. Yeah. Um, as, as we've talked about before, you know, there are many, many people, and you know, some of you may be here, might be online, there, there's some people who are very far from God now. Uh, let's just face it, right? I mean, it's just so... Our calling around mission is, will we stick with people for the long haul? Are we gonna build friendships with people over years and love them and care and be hospitable and welcome, be there when somebody's sick or when there's a wedding or a funeral or all these kinds of things? Are we going to hang in there with people? And I, I think Paul would tell us in Acts, absolutely we're called to. Okay, and then if there's one more idea that, it almost caught me by surprise because I was not expecting this, and I got a lot of feedback from you guys when we talked about it, but that is this understanding of this great hall of Christianity, this great hall of mere Christianity, this great hall of mere Christianity where the main thing has to be the main thing, and, and let's not get stuck in these little small rooms where we have all these differences of, of, of opinions. By the way, on some really important things, and it's not like uh, there's, there's, there are unimportant issues, they are important, it's just that they're not the most important. And when we make something that is less important, most important, then we wind up getting really, really frustrated with one another when we don't believe the same way. And, and so that idea, I mean, I, my word, so many people talked with me and said, man, I mean, can you even talk about this some more? Because it made a whole lot of sense. Well, you know, what's the main thing of mere Christianity? And very simply, it is like the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and it goes on and on. I mean, that's, that's mere Christianity. Uh, mere Christianity is the, the good news of the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, mere Christianity is you and I being saved by, by grace through faith. The, the, the mere Christianity is Jesus Christ as the, as the crucified Savior, the resurrected God, and the risen Lord. I mean, the mere Christianity focuses on who Jesus is, and, and mere Christianity focuses on how do we follow Jesus, who is all of those things. That's, that's like mere Christianity. Yeah. And so, uh, Brian, I mentioned as I was going through the book of Acts in this chronological study Bible, um, it, it really hit me reading Titus. Now, we, we mentioned that some of the last letters Paul wrote were the pastoral epistles. And a lot of times I put all my focus on First and Second Timothy. And then I just give a little bit of attention to Titus, almost checking, okay, cause is he saying the same thing that he said in First Timothy? Right. Um, well, this time I, I actually spent some time reading Titus. And wow, was I, was I ever surprised? So in Titus chapter 3, again, one of the very last letters Paul wrote, uh, at the beginning of chapter 3, in my N, uh, New International Version, the title is Saved in Order to Do Good. Yeah. Now, I, I like that. Saved in Order to Do Good. So listen to Paul talk about mere Christianity in Titus chapter 3. Titus is one of his beloved sons of the faith. Titus, uh, one of these young emerging leaders to whom the future of the church was being entrusted. So listen to what Paul's saying. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved not very, very positive terms, but that's who we were. And therefore, because we were those things, we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Man, just, I mean, Paul's always honest, and that's exactly what they experienced in that first century world. They were being hated, and they were hating one another. That was like their condition. And, and then he says, and then the, loving, then the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. And when it appeared, he saved us. 
And he didn't save us because we had gotten our act together and we were doing all these great and wonderful things. No, he saved us because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing power of the Holy Spirit. He saved us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Uh, he saved us by justifying us. That's a rich, rich word. And we became these, these, uh, these children of hope for the promise of eternal life. I mean, right there is the gospel. Wonderful things that God has done. But now listen to what he says next. It's almost like, in light of all of this, I want you to, Titus, I want you to stress these things so that all of us here at Living Word who have trusted in God, we may be careful to devote ourselves to doing what is good. I, I want you to encourage all of those people, remind all of those people they've already trusted God, that now devote themselves, be careful to do what is good. And, and then like five verses later, he said, you know, just in case I didn't make it clear, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. And then I did turn back to 1 Timothy, and sure enough, it's right there in a little bit of a different language. Uh, he says, command those who are rich in this present world, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Mm. Man, okay, so I think right there, that's the great hall of Christianity. We are united around the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that has saved us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. He just gave it to us so generously. Right. And now as people of grace, we are transformed to do as much good as we can. And I just want to tell you, I, one of the things I was drawn to Living Word, and I've been drawn to Living Word for almost 40 years, is like, that's who Living Word is. We are a place of grace, and we are a place of people who just love to do good things. I mean, I'm not going to tell stories of some names because I don't want to embarrass anybody or put anybody out. But, oh, my word, I, I just walk around and even walk around out there in the lobby today and just say, oh, my word, like, I know, I know the good works you're doing. I just know the good stuff you're doing. Like, I know the love you're doing out there in the community. I know the people that you care about so much. I mean, this is a, this is a church filled with people who want to do good. On, on Glow Night, I was, I was talking and, and, and a woman shared about, about her nine-year-old who who wanted to give money to Ukraine. He had $5. He said he wants to give, the, he wanted to do good. He wanted to help the people in Ukraine. And so they got online and he, he, she made a $5 donation of his money to Ukraine. Yeah. And, and she dropped the money in the offering basket again as well. Hmm. He, like here's a, like a nine-year-old who wants to do good. Yay, God, because that's, that's, what, that's what grace is all about. Just changing people who want to do good to everybody. And not just people like ourselves, but people who are really, really different. I mean, when that's happened, that's the kingdom of God, isn't it? Yep. And, and Friday night, there was, um, Cass told me before, we, we had lots of you who, who served, like 60 plus, and we could not have done Friday night without our ministry partners. There's no way. Our oldest ministry partners, not to tell anybody's age, but I will, um, but I won't point out who you are, were 79 and 80 years old. And... <laughs> And Cass yeah. said, yeah, let's hear it for the 79 and 80 year old. And they were like in charge of the bounce castle room or something. And, and Cass just said they were thrilled by doing this. I mean, it was just like, and talk about being out of your comfort zone and stuff. I mean, and they were just there doing good and just loving people and being hospitable. Tremendous. And, and that's also why more and more you guys are just hearing us talk about reach, reach local. I mean, we, we are here in this community, and we've been here for more than four decades, and Lumen is going to be around for a long time by God's grace. And we're here just to do as much good in this little section of God's amazingly great planet Earth. We're here to do as much good as we possibly can so people are drawn to the grace of Jesus Christ and want to come and partake in, uh, in that grace. Yep. Okay, you got a final word for us? Yeah, when you asked me this, you know, this week, I, I really pondered it. I... I this is what I come back to about close, sort of closing the book of Acts for me. Um, it is about, uh, I don't come out of a background where Jesus was central at all. So I, I've come back to this sense of Jesus as the king of the kingdom. And he changes everything. Jesus as king of the kingdom for me changes everything. And I, I think if I had a final word. All right, so Brian, you and I have spent, you know, decades and decades training leaders because we really believe in the importance of leadership. But I, I think what Paul grabbed hold of is that what's even more important is the people. This total group of people who together, 
I mean, you know, when, when you guys are together, you are so much greater than when you're apart. When we are together, so leaders come and go. They just do. And, you know, there'll be more leaders that will come and go in the years to come. But somehow there's a continuity of church remains, a people remain. And Living Word's future, I mean, we, we were talking for a long time, the best is yet to come. For about two years of COVID and upheaval, we thought, oh, maybe the best has already come and gone. <laughs> but no, because of you guys, the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. 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 Yay, God. Yay, God. Hey, let's, um, let me just pray for you, and then we're going to have a little bit more worship. Uh, Lord, thank you for the church. Uh, Jesus, thank you that this is your church. Thank you that you suffered and died and were resurrected from the dead and you rose and ascended and you have sent your spirit and you've given us your word and it is simply unstoppable. Mm. Hallelujah. And it is unfinished. And we want to just be a part of your kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. And so God, please do that in all of us. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.